Um, and uh, today we are very happy to have um, Professor Emma Lundberg from uh, SciLife Sci Labs from Sweden. And she received her master's and PhD from KTH, Royal Institute of Technology in Biotechnology. And then she um, has been working in SciLife Labs recently for about 10 years. And she has been also in um, sabbatical visitor positions and visiting associate professor positions at the CZ, the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and Stanford University at the Department of Genetics. And, um, and recently also she has been um, uh, a professor and she has been also leading the director of director cell atlas of human protein atlas project. And also she uh, has co-founded MindForce Game Lab and some of the work I think she's gonna talk about today. So this is pretty cool, the cell images with some games, very innovative. And that was also published in major journals. And without further ado, then I'll turn to Dr. Bloomberg. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for tuning in this close to the holidays. Uh, it's great to be able to talk to you. Let me just share my screen and please, add questions to the chat or shout out if there's something urgent that you want to ask me about. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our work to understand how proteins are organized in cell. So spatial proteomics at the subcellular level. And the reason that I think that this is very important information is, of course, that cellular processes are partitioned in time and space and that protein localization is closely connected to protein function. And it's also known that if a cell encounters some kind of perturbation, there will be genes that are up and down regulated, but there will also be proteins that are translocated. And these are to a large extent independent uh, regulatory mechanisms. So I believe that in order to understand cells as systems, uh, we have to measure also proteins and their spatial distribution. So that's probably what I'm going to try to convince you of today. And um, as Ahmed said, uh, most of my work is closely connected to the Human Protein Atlas project. And in this project, we're mapping the human proteome using our in-house generated protein-wide collection of antibodies. I could spend a lot of time talking about validation of antibodies, but I'm going to spare you of that. But please reach out if you have any questions or want to discuss it. Um, the database has about 300,000 users per month and it's freely and openly available. And I do want to point out that our raw data is images. We have about 20 million images in the Protein Atlas. And this is, of course, a great starting point for building machine learning models for understanding spatial biology. And today I'm going to mainly talk about the fluorescent images that you see here, the subcellular uh, partitioning of proteins, but we do work a lot with the tissue images as well. So I'm happy to discuss that if anyone has questions. So to get started, I will uh, talk, well, during today's talk, I will talk a bit about proteome partitioning in space, in time, and then on some computational methods to, to understand spatial patterns. But to start with the spatial uh, profiling, we're using confocal microscopy to get a high resolution insight into human cells. And then we're using a standardized set of markers, which is good for computational reasons. So we stay in the nucleus, the microtubules, and the plasmic reticulum. And on top of this, we use our in-house generated antibodies to visualize proteins one by one. And we can do this, this is all automated. We do this at scale, immunostaining and imaging and everything. So if it looks like this, we say that this protein is in the plasma membrane. And this protein is in the cytosol, this protein is in the mitochondria, in the Golgi apparatus, in actin filaments, and so on. And we can currently pinpoint proteins to about 32 different cellular structures or even more. And based on this, well, for I would say for 10 years, we did this very systematic mapping and we could finally provide this subcellular map of the human proteome where we localized 12,000 proteins to 32 different cellular structures. And at this point of time, when this paper was published, half of these proteins had no information about their localization. So it's really basic biological data that we provided. 
And with this information, we could define organelle proteomes. So it's very like useful cell biology data to study proteins on, or organelle biology. And during my talk today, I will talk a bit about what we've been doing ever since. So based on these findings. So one very interesting observation, I think, is that we could see that half of all human proteins localize to more than one compartment of the cell. So of course, there can be a lot of pleiotropic effects through multi-localizing proteins. And these proteins may have context-specific function and moonlight in different parts of the cell. And this would then increase the functionality of the proteum and also the complexity of the cell from a systems perspective. So this is one of the key arguments, I think, for why we have to describe cells with spatial information and not only its molecular components, uh, so to say. But to make it even more complex, I will show you this example. This is one protein. And if you're used to looking, looking at images like this, you can see that in some cells, the protein is in the nucleus, in some it's in the cytosol, in some it's both, and sometimes we also see it on the plasma membrane. But in addition to this spatial heterogeneity, we also see an, a heterogeneity in expression levels here. So the protein is expressed at maybe twice the level in this cell compared to this cell. So even though these cells are genetically identical, this protein is very differently expressed and distributed. And this happens to be a well-known moonlighting enzyme. This is enolase 1. It's a glycolytic enzyme in the cytosol, plus minogen receptor in the, on the plasma membrane and has some kind of DNA binding activity in the nucleus. So by, even though these cells are genetically identical, they do present a functional heterogeneity thanks to this one protein being differentially distributed and expressed. So we were quite intrigued to figure out what, what, what is the extent of this cell-to-cell -cell variability of the entire proteome, not only this uh, protein. If we look at cells, is one cell ever similar to another cell, for example? So we turned to our collection of images and mined them to look for images that show cell-to-cell -cell variability. So either that the protein is only expressed in some cells or that we see high expression in some cells, low expression in other cells or that we see this kind of spatial variation that the protein is in the Golgi apparatus here in some cells, but in these cells, it's in the endoplasmic reticulum. And in total, we could show that 18% of the human proteome show such clear single cell variability in cultivated cell lines. And this is something that we could reproduce in many different cell lines that we test. So it seems to be regulated by some kind of conserved mechanism across cell lines. So in order, we believe these are log phase growing cells. So we believe that when we see cell to cell heterogeneity, it actually indicates that there is some kind of dynamics going on in the expression of that protein, which means that we need temporal resolution in order to understand what's going on here. So the past five years, I should say, we spent on trying to build pipelines to do temporal protein profiling as well. And Diana, Anthony, and Christian spent a lot of time on this. And we can, well, first of all, start to go back and think about what are the types of temporal heterogeneity that we see in cells. Of course, we see this type of short timescale variation signaling that leads to expression changes or these more oscillatory patterns like the circadian rhythm or the cell cycle. We can also see a lot of longer transgenerational variations where something is inherited from the mother cell to the daughter cell and then propagated further on. But uh, I'm mainly interested in proteome changes that are not driven by transcriptional regulation. And it is known that we all know that RNA and, and protein levels don't correlate perfectly, but it is known that this, the discrepancy is the, as the largest uh, in dynamic transitions. So we decided to focus on these more shorter timescale variations. And to make it easy for ourselves, we decided to work with the cell cycle initially. And because of course we need temporally resolved assays in order to, to study this. So we decided to at first study these proteins that show cell to cell heterogeneity and determine how much of this heterogeneity that correlates to cell cycle progression. And to make it easy for ourselves, we are stuck with antibodies and static images. So sometimes it's easy. This is a protein where, which is only expressed on the mitotic chromosome. So we can clearly say that the expression is correlated to the cell cycle. So we started with the easiest part to identify all the proteins that are spatiotemporally restricted to mitotic cellular structures. And we found 230 such proteins of which 150 were previously not known. And I wanna say that there's a lot of interesting 
proteins on the mitotic chromosome that have very high intrinsic disorder, if anyone is interested in that. But to be able to study um, protein expression in correlation to interface progression of the cell cycle, we had to turn to some kind of model system. So we decided to use the FUCHI cell model uh, where the cells express a red fluorescent marker in G1 and then they turn yellow and then express a green fluorescent marker. So by measuring the red and green fluorescence in the cells, we can follow the trajectory of the cell cycle and fit the model and make a linear representation of pseudo time based on these two uh, markers. So we took the Fuji cells and we did single cell sequencing and also uh, single, well, imaging proteomics using the antibodies that target all of these proteins that show cell to cell heterogeneity. Sorry. Um, and in the end, when we sort the cells according to their cell cycle pseudotime position, we expect to see kind of um, profiles appearing if the protein expression is correlated to the cell cycle, whereas if it's not, we expect to see flat lines. And this is exactly what we got. This is just some controls that we had at the top. Aniline, a known, well-known cell cycle regulator. We can see this um, unimodal peak pattern and we can determine the time of peak expression here in G2 as expected. Sintrine is a protein that shows very high variability, high and low expression, but we see cells that are of low expression and high expression in every phase of the cell cycle and we just get this flat line again. So it's a, what we call a non-cell cycle dependent protein. And in every sample, we also have controls that of proteins that are not variable. So to just summarize this, and we studied 1,560, we targeted 1,564 proteins in this study. Uh, so to summarize uh, a long study in one slide, uh, in total, we could find, find 552 cell cycle dependent proteins and 402 cell cycle dependent transcripts. And there are several interesting observations here. One is that we find more cell cycle dependent proteins than we find cell cycle dependent transcripts. Uh, second one is that while most of the transcripts are known cell cycle regulators, a, a lot of the proteins are novel findings. And I'll get back to this. What is also interesting is that we see that most RNAs peak in G1, whereas most proteins peak in G2, and the average temporal delay between peak of RNA and protein expression is 8.6 hours. And this is quite comparable to what is seen in the literature for, for example, circadian rhythm. But if we look at these, these uh, cell cycle dependent proteins, we can roughly divide them into two groups. So the first group would be represented by the two top examples here, two well-known cell cycle regulators again, where we do see this temporal profile at both the RNA and protein level. Whereas the bottom two examples are the two interesting ones. These are two new cell cycle regulators that we've discovered in this study. And as you can see, we have, they peak in different times of the cell cycle. They're called DUSP18 and 19. Uh, but what is clear is that they're both stable at the RNA level. So likely this temporal profile is obtained by some kind of post-translational regulation. What is also very nice with this type of single cell analysis is of course that we can find other types of cell cycle correlating expression. Not only this unimodal types of peaks, but we can find proteins with bimodal expression patterns. And sometimes this is really with a grain of salt, but Sometimes, you know, we see trends of some kind of oscillatory pattern, like the fifth harmonics of the cell cycle. Of course, we can't really say this is too few data points, but we, we can see that there seem to be some trends of other proteins vary, varying with the cell cycle, but at a different harmonic. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we can say that out of the proteins with variable expression, only 26% are correlated to the cell cycle. But uh, among these proteins, we still find 301 novel cell cycle proteins, most of them stable at the RNA level. There's many proteins of clinical interest here, for example, novel markers of cell proliferation. And we've also proven by, for example, gene silencing experiments that some of these proteins are indeed involved in the regulation of proliferation. So there's a lot to dig into here. And, and this paper is soon published, but for now it's available on BioArchive. But I do want to show you some, one, some examples here as well. Uh, one example is of an unexpected finding that we might not have found if we didn't do this with spatial resolution. So if we measure the entire cell, we didn't get a nice correlation to the cell cycle. But when we only measure the nucleus, we do see something that is cell cycle correlated. 
So this is UGDH, it's an enzyme that is involved in the production of components of the extracellular matrix. So it's a cytosolic enzyme that secretes things to the extracellular matrix. And it has been shown to be correlated, it, high expression correlated with worse prognosis in several types of cancers, but I don't think the mechanism has been understood. But what we can see here is that this enzyme actually translocates to the nucleus in G1, and then the expression in the nucleus gradually increases throughout the cell cycle, and then it reverts again. So th there is some kind of, for some proteins, we see a partial correlation to the cell cycle, but maybe not in total level of expression. And this is, of course, very interesting because this can connect maybe extracellular effects with cell proliferation and also connect metabolism to proliferation. So something that we're interested in looking, looking deeper into. Uh, but to get to the even more exciting part, even though we were surprised that only 26% of the proteins that show cell-to-cell -cell heterogeneity are correlating to the cell cycle, we were also very intrigued by the fact that so many are not. So what are they doing then? Must not We can kind of cross out the cell cycle. So is it circadian rhythm, signaling? What's going on? We don't really know. <laughs> uh, so here we decided to work with uh, GFP tagging and really do live cell imaging to be able to study this. And this is all unpublished, very preliminary data I'm going to show you. So uh, there's probably more questions than answers. Uh, but maybe it can inspire you to something, um, or maybe you can give me some answers. Uh, what is interesting here is that what we do see is an enrichment for metabolic enzymes. So I told you before that if we look at all proteins, 18% show cell-to-cell -cell heterogeneity, but if we look at metabolic enzymes, 40% shows cell-to-cell -cell heterogeneity, and the majority of these are non-cell cycle dependent. And this goes for all classes of metabolism. And if we look at these examples, it's often a combination of variation in expression level and spatial relocalization, which is again, very interesting because there might be moonlighting function for these enzymes, particularly in the nucleus. This is one example, this is HMGCS1. It's an enzyme in the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. Its canonical function is in the cytosol. And we can see that we can see it in the nucleus in some cells and a high expression in other cells. So what we did here is that we, uh, together with Manu Leonetti at the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, we used this pipeline to do biallelic GFP tagging, CRISPR tagging of this gene. And then we sequence verified, of course, everything. And then we took a single cell and let that single cell grow to a population of cells to ask the question, can a single cell recapitulate this entire phenotypic heterogeneity? Because we're still working with antibodies. We're always afraid of cross-reactivity. And this is the results that we got. So we were very happy with this, of course, that we could show that a single cell can indeed reproduce this entire uh, protein expression, all of these distinct protein expression phenotypes that we see. And this was actually the case for, so far we've tagged 80 different enzymes, and this is the case for almost all of them. And uh, just to show you, this is at this point, if I give live talks, people will ask, but this is cell lines. Is it really true? Are you sure that this is relevant? Well, I think so. Um, because if we turn to the tissue atlas of the protein atlas, we can actually see similar heterogeneity in tissues here. Again, HMGCS1. And if we look in the glandular cells in stomach, or if we look in the senior cells in pancreas, we can see that we have cells with high expression, low expression, nuclear localization, cytosolic localization. And again, we can see this across all, all types of metabolism here illustrated for lipid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism and amino acid metabolism. And here are examples of that we see that single cell heterogeneity also in breast tumors. So we are very intrigued by this uh, metabolic heterogeneity, our preliminary data points to that this is some kind of shorter time scale oscillations, five, six hours often. Uh, and we're also very intrigued by this, that we for so many cytosolic enzymes see this rare translocations to the nucleus. And we're intrigued to try to find out what this function is. So there's many questions to answer. What is the cause and what's the consequence of these variations? What's the level of cellular regulation, RNA or protein? Uh, so far, it points towards that this is mainly non-genetic variability, but we need to confirm that. 
also are there, are there you know, cellular, cellular states or intrinsic oscillatory systems that we are yet unaware of? And how do metabolic and proliferative states interconnect? Some of the questions we're trying to answer with live cell imaging and look at also inheritance from mother to daughter and, and also do um, simulations of population expression levels. So I guess that with this talk, what I wanted to say is that I think it's important to consider protein and spatial proteomics as a readout for non-genetic cellular heterogeneity, because I believe that if we don't study protein expression and localization in addition to genetic regulation at a single cell level, we will miss out on complete layers of cellular regulation. So I really think that we can leverage a lot of studies by including this. And of course, uh, Ideally, we need to work with multiplexed imaging. And this is something that we're doing now. We're building panels to look at metabolic states and uh, precise cell cycle positioning and so on. And we're mainly working with the codex technology and also some cyclic technologies like the 4i technology. And uh, something that we're doing that I'm not gonna talk more about, but I wanted to mention is that we're part of the a human cell atlas, the developmental version of it. So in Sweden, we're mapping the developing human lung, brain, and heart together with Mats Nilsson and Stian Linnarsson and Joachim Landerberg with all these spatial technologies. So maybe there can be a talk in the future from all four of us together. Um, this is uh, just to show you an example of a, a multiplex image from a fetal lung, a six-week lung, where we can see these progenitor uh, immune cells forming around the distal airways and that we can see even more prominently already in five weeks. So there seems to be some interesting immune niches here, but we're not experts in the immune system. So if any of you are and want to be, you know, discuss this with us, we'll be very happy to do it. So please reach out. The spatial aspects is our expertise. So with that, I would wanna shift gears a little bit and talk about image analysis and the challenges and solutions we've encountered uh, along the way. So one uh, question of course is, I've been talking about these spatial patterns, but how do we classify and quantify spatial distribution patterns? And as I'm sure that this crowd knows, it's not as trivial as it may sound. And even though cell lines are a lot easier than tissues, it's still not an easy task because of many reasons. We have a great class imbalance. Some patterns are common, some patterns are rare. We work with 16 different, 60 different cell lines and this is the same protein, actin filament protein in three different cell lines. They look very morphologically different. We have single cell variations and then we have the multi-localizing proteins. In total, if we look at, we are annotating 32 different um, locations, but the combinatorial number of different uh, labels is 555. So it, it's, a really hard multi-label problem. So a couple of years back, we figured that this is kind of <laughs> tedious work and we have a lot of images. It would be nice to get some help. And humans are very good at recognizing patterns. So maybe we can turn to the crowd, to the citizens and do citizen science to get help with this. And inspired by some very famous citizen science games like Fold It and other examples, we decided to go for a citizen science game. But in, com in contrast to these other games, uh, we decided to work together with a Swiss startup called MMOS and a um, game producer called CCP Games. And they are the producers of the massively multiplayer online game, EVE Online. So we decided to, instead of making a standalone game, which we are not game developers, <laughs> uh, we decided to instead inject a scientific task into an existing computer game so that we could make use of their player base and hopefully generate data faster. Uh, the game is called Project Discovery and uh, can be opened at any time in this virtual universe. And for you to get a feeling for the game, I will now show you a little movie. And this is a news broadcast from the in-game news channel that was broadcasted when this mini game was launched in the virtual universe of EVE Online. The sudden drifter pullback to the five known hive systems are believed to be connected to the Capsuleer reports that gate restrictions in those systems have been removed, clearing the path for Capsuleers committed to pushing back the drifter menace. The conflict has certainly taken its toll on the Amar military, and talks of the withdrawal being a reaction to Sisters of Eve, and Capsuleer actions only adds insult to injury for the Amar. 
Meanwhile, Sisters of Eve has launched a crowdsourced analysis of collected drifter data entitled Project Discovery and rallied under the banner of Citizen Science Begins With You. They hope to unlock the new drifter tech so that they may be made public and shared with all. This is Lena Amber reporting for The Scope. So what you could see there is how the game designers integrated the, the scientific question with the game narrative. So there are these drifters, these creatures, they're invading, they're powerful, they're dangerous. So in game, there is this more friendly association called Sisters of Eve that launched a crowdsourced effort in game led by Professor Lundberg. Uh, of course, we rely on the, the scientists in times of crisis, right? Uh, so Professor Lundberg asks the, the gamers to please help me. I've collected these pieces of the drifters. They are, they call them DNA, but it's proteins. <laughs> but the game designers were very strict on that. No one knows what proteins are, but ev everyone knows what DNA is. So, and I think they sadly were right. So anyway, uh, Professor Lundberg tells the gamers that we've collected these pieces from the drifters. If you help us to classify these images, you might be able to collectively both help science, but also to unlock the secrets of the drifters and maybe clone their superpowers and their tech. The game itself is a pretty simple game. It's a screen that can be opened at any time, any place, and the players get um, an image presented to them and they can toggle channels on and off and they're asked to click one to five patterns that they see in here. And then they have example images of all the different patterns. They have uh, scientific descriptions, non-scientific descriptions, and so on. They also have to go through a training and a tutorial before they can classify real samples. And of course, the game has everything, uh, you know, all the game mechanics the game should have. There's ranking, you start out being a novice analyst, you end up being professor of analysis if you play well and for a long time. It's a pretty nice title. Um, and there's also swag like combat suits, for example. So we were very, very happy with this game. It was already after a week, we surpassed our kind of dream goal of participation. So it was clear to us that it was a very efficient way of gaining, you know, getting people to help out. And we didn't have to spend time trying to recruit people to help out in our research projects because we could tap into this existing computer game. So over 300,000 players over one year time provided 32 million image classifications. And if we look at the time that they spent on this mini game alone, they spent 70 working years in there. So it's pretty remarkable, I would say. I was very overwhelmed by this. Uh, but now at this point, we had to prove to the world that can really gamers do as good science as scientists? Because these other citizen science projects, they recruited people because they were interested in science. Whereas in EVE Online, we don't know why people are playing or who they are or anything. So we spent a lot of time after this uh, game was closed to analyze the data. And we decided to compare it with something. So we built the machine learning model, a very simple one. And then we also blindly tested experts, so people from my team. And just to make a long story short, this is the result. So you have position and recall here. Every gray dot here is a gamer. So you can see that the average gamer is not very good, but there are gamers that are as good as experts. But what is nice here is that we have so much data. So when we aggregate the gamer results, they're actually pretty good. And they're even slightly better than our machine learning model. But here, I also wanna point out that this is a very hard problem because before this paper and this study, if we looked at scientific literature, the best models out there could classify 10 patterns, no mixture of patterns in one cell line. So I'd like to remind you that this is a hard problem. It's 30 cell lines, it's 30 patterns, and it's mixed patterns. So I would say that the gamers and our machine learning model did very, very well. Unfortunately, we still think that they're there. We would like them to be closer to us experts so that we can really, you know, stop doing this <laughs> manual uh, labeling ourselves. Uh, and then we also compared what are the gamers good at and what are the machine learning models good at. And it turns out that the gamers are actually very good at finding rare patterns where the machine learning model fails. So we could uh, create this menu model where we augment the, you know, add gamer input to the machine learning model that uh, outperforms them both, but still not quite as good as experts. But 
something really good that we can still work with automatically in our pipelines. So altogether, I would say that this project was super fun, very rewarding in many ways. Uh, and we found, for example, eight or nine new rods and rings proteins. And when this project started, there was only three known rods and rings proteins. And we still don't know what this structure is doing. And it also helped us to take the protein atlas cell atlas from 23 to 30 locations. So it, it did provide very good scientific data. And it also provided a very nice cover on a nice journal with a spaceship for the first time. So we are happy to say that we showed a path forward to how massively multiplayer online citizen science can feed into tailored machine learning algorithms for scalable and improved data classification. And I'm myself convinced that tapping into computer games as a portal for harnessing the brain processing powers of humans is something that we'll see more and more of. And that is the, the company that I founded, Mindforce Game Lab, does um, games as medical devices to, to, for example, increase medication adherence and other things. So I, I'm quite sure we'll see more of this. And this game in particular, Project Discovery, has been reused for discovery of exoplanets, and then it has been reused currently is being reused for helping with the uh, flow cytometry segmentation in uh, COVID-19 samples. So you can still help science by playing EVE Online. But at this point, we weren't still quite happy with the model. We wanted a better model. And we all know that deep learning is really, really good for classifying images. So we decided that we, we, we of course, keep track of how people use the Human Protein Atlas. And we know that most people don't work with our images as raw data. So we also wanted to encourage this. So we launched a Kaggle challenge and basically asked the Kagglers to beat the gamers <laughs> and beat our machine learning model. And they did. Uh, so we had very high participation and we saw many types of different architectures and we did work together with the top ranking teams and did comparison ablation studies and so on. So we got some really, really nice models out of this study and it's published in Nature Methods now. But I, I just wanna show you, I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but there, there's a lot of details in the paper if you wanna read it. But I wanna show this because this is something I was so excited about. It's taken us many years to get to this point. So if we take a version of the top ranking model and just use it as a feature extractor. So we take the, the 10, 1024 features from the second last layer in this network and do a UMAP dimensionality reduction. This is what it looks like. So this is, Every dot here is one protein. So this is all 14,000 proteins in the cell atlas. And this is also a mixture of 30 different cell lines. And what I think is remarkable is that we can see that even in this reduced dimensions, all these 30 different locations are actually distinguished from each other. So we can see that this, these are the nuclear locations, these are the cytosolic locations and so on. But most importantly here, if you look, for example, at point F here, this is the gray dots here. They, they are the proteins that are multi-localizing, so the proteins with several labels. F here is a protein that is found in the nucleus, the red cluster, and in the nucleolus, purple cluster. So we can see that it ends up right in between these two pure clusters. Same thing for D here. This protein is found in the nucleus, the plasma membrane, and the cytosol, and it ends up right in between. So at this point, we were very excited because we believe that we were finally at the point that we could, we have a model that is good enough so that we can actually embed the spatial information into a format that is possible to integrate with other types of omics data, because that's something that we never really did before. So I'll, I'll get back to that. But before that, I want to say, if you're interested in pattern classification, we are launching a new challenge um, related to this one uh, in January. So please join or help us spread the word and this is also a collaboration with nature methods so it's uh, we'd love to see you as co-authors as well so this model we've been ever since we we got this model we've been using it so one example that we used this for was that we i could identify that there were a new subtype of patterns in the nucleolus that we call the nucleolus rim do you see this circle like pattern here and here so we could, this has previously been seen, but people assumed that it was a staining artifact, but we could actually demonstrate that this is a sublocalization of the nucleolus, a fourth subcompartment that has a distinct proteome composition. We found 157 proteins that are enriched in this uh, spatial location. And we could also show that these 
proteins, nucleolar proteins in general have higher intrinsic disorder compared to cytosolic proteins and other proteins in the cell. But this was even more prominent for proteins in the nucleolar rim. And it's also very common that proteins in the nucleolar rim go to the mitotic chromosome during mitosis. So we hypothesized that the nucleolar rim proteins are associated with the perinucleolar chromatin and aids in the tethering of the nucleolus to the chromatin. But this remains to be confirmed. And then in order to really see if we can integrate spatial data with other types of data, we teamed up with Trey Eidecker at UCSD and decided to try to integrate data across scales. So what we did here is that we worked with the HEC293 cells and we have protein-protein interaction data from the Bioplex database out of Harvard. So Steve Gigi and Wade Harper and Ed Hutlin. And then we have our images, confocal images, and then we embed this data using either our model for feature extraction from the images or um, a node to vec model for embedding these protein-protein interaction networks. And then we can take these um, feature vectors and translate them to pairwise protein distances, which we can calibrate to physical distances in nanometer. And then based on this, we build this multi-scale subcellular hierarchy that is, I guess, the signum of Trey Eidecker. So we gradually, you know, relax the parameters and in this way we can build this hierarchy of the human cell. And MUSIC, we call this uh, model MUSIC, multi-scale integrated cell. It reveals 69 cellular systems of which half are previously undocumented. So we can validate some of these systems to reveal crosstalk, for example, between cytoplasmic and mitochondrial ribosomes and identify roles of poorly characterized proteins. So we believe that the reason that we get so many new cellular systems by integrating this type of data is that protein-protein interactions measure distances at you know, the nanometer distance, whereas our images measures much longer distances. So while when we're integrating this, we're basically giving protein-protein interactions a spatial dimension, and we're giving room to this pleiotropic effects that multilocalizing proteins can have, for example. So uh, we're quite excited about this. And just to show you the advantage of this data integration, if, if we try to build the same type of hierarchy with either data type alone, uh, you see that with only the images, we get very few uh, systems with only the PPI data, we get also very few systems, but a bit more than with only the images. But when we integrate them both, we really see this, you know, synergistic effect. So we're quite excited about this. And we believe that this type of, of um, integration across scales could also be used for other types of data and maybe even be extended to go beyond single cells to populations or so of cells, for example. Something else that we often uh, will think about is, can we use machine learning to generate artificial images for real-time analysis and cell modeling? And this is mainly work done by Wei Ouyang and Trang Li in my lab. So one thing that we're thinking a lot about when we, we work a lot with automated pipelines for data generation, and of course, we would want to work with augmented microscopy so that we, at the microscope, provide augment the microscopy view with additional information layers and annotations that are generated in real time so that we can do smart feedback microscopy and generate you know exactly the data that we need but not much much more than that so this is a perspective article that we wrote a couple of years back just to to illustrate that we believe that this is the future for microscopy so some things that we've done here if you think about what i talked talked about before these uh, tagged cell lines that where we can see enzymes that translocate to the nucleus, for example, or show cell to cell heterogeneity. Ideally, we wanna image these cells and do real time statistics, but then we also need to be able to segment the cells. And we don't wanna use more labels because then we will easily get phototoxicity. So what we did is that we used a hex cell with a fluorescently labeled, a GFP labeled membrane protein. And we used that to train a model to just predict a membrane strain directly from the bright field. And then we made a lightweight model of this, um, of this predictor so that we can use it at, in real time at the microscope. So right now we can generate these predicted membrane stains at a speed of 142 frames per second. So faster than the actual image acquisition so that we can do real time statistics. Something that we're, I would say, work, are working towards instead, this is 
a long, like long-term goal for my lab is to see if we can generate a digital whole cell model. Because basically we have millions of images with the same reference marker, but then one human protein per image. Ideally, we would want one image or one model that holds all the proteins. And ideally, we would also be able to show and test this model on different morphological scaffolds. So please bear with me. This is very preliminary work and it, it, it's work in progress. Uh, but I thought I could show you some highlights. So to start with here, we decided to work with one protein that shows cell to cell heterogeneity. So we decided to work with cyclin B1 because it changes both expression level and spatial localization over the cell cycle. So the preliminary uh, results, this is also a DPN UNET model, shows that if we input DOPI and microtubules that you can see at the top here, this is the target and this is the output, we can quite accurately predict the expression level and also capture this spatial translocation to the nucleus that you see in some cells with this model. And this also means that if we can predict the expression of cyclin B1, we can basically also infer the cell cycle position directly from DOPI and microtubules in these images. And that's another layer that we can add to this augmented microscopy view. But of course, cyclin B1 is only one protein. <laughs> and is this possible for 13,000 proteins? We don't know, but inspired by the style GANs, we decided to go for a pretty crazy project <laughs> and we'll see where it ends. But you know, the style GANs are, I mean, GANs are generative adversarial networks, of course, and style GANs are used for conditional cell image generation uh, as published by Karas et al. So this image is from their publication. Um, these are source images. And then you can see, you can tune the style and say, add glasses or remove glasses or make the hair dark, make the skin bright or whatever you wanna change, but you can basically tune it. So we were thinking that what if we try to build a cell similarly to these faces and make it photorealistic and everything. And then we can maybe tune different parameters, move this protein to the nucleolus or make this cell larger and, and see if we can learn relationships between different proteins and actually learn enough from that exercise so that we can build some kind of, of cell model. Uh, I told you it was crazy project, but so this is basically what we're doing. We're training a style GAN to generate cell images, HPA style cell images, I should say. You see some training data here. And as conditions, we add cell type, cell cycle state, what protein is being stained and so on, for example. And it turns out that we can generate quite photorealistic images and we can also generate images that looks like different cell lines. These are just some examples. So if you're not used to looking at these images, you could probably believe that they're real. I would tell that this is fake at least based on this, but they're very close to what we're looking at. And this would look a lot like a U2S cell line. And this looks like the U251 cell line, for example. So, what we're working towards now is to build some kind of in silico whole proteum spatial model uh, that in the long term, ideally, we would want to do some kind of in silico experiments and perturbations. But of course, we need to generate much, much more data for that. But what we believe is that we need to, to take this model to single cell generations, and then we're going to augment it with a lot more auxiliary data. For example, if we introduce protein-protein interactions as constraints, that will probably uh, change the spatial parameters a bit. We can also add, for example, predictions of structure or genetic sequences and a lot of different types of auxiliary or, or um, complementary data. So this is kind of our uh, playground at the moment. So happy to hear your thoughts if any of you are working in this direction as well. And in as you can hear, I talk a lot about unpublished data. I truly believe in open science, sharing data, tools, and models. This is something we've always done from the Protein Atlas from the very get-go in 2005 when we released the first version of the Atlas. Um, but uh, in line with this, we in particular has been working and also how has been working with uh, the development of, of platforms and tools for this. So we developed this Enjoy platform for an open source browser-based platform for re reuse of machine learning models. I should say that he started this before he joined my lab. So this is really his, his work. Uh, it uh, holds a plugin repository on GitHub and su supports hybrid computing mode. So you can easily deploy a deep learning model to run in, in from your phone or have it run in the browser locally or in the cloud. 
uh, you can check it out at imjoy.io. And more recently, we extended this so that you can also use uh, the, the bio engine behind, behind Imjoy to also run ImageJ in the browser, which is very nice. For example, if you want to do teaching or if you want to do markup and annotations in ImageJoy and then in, in sorry, in Fiji and then uh, in ImageJ and then move over to, for example, a deep train a deep learning model using ImageJoy. So it facilitates these transitions, for example. So I would say it's great for collaboration, sharing and teaching. And of course, it's also good because you can embed it in your Jupyter notebooks and run ImageJ directly from there. We are also working with, um, you know, some really, really great people within image analysis, Florian Jag and Akreshuk and also Wei uh, in my group uh, to build the bioimage model zoo because we believe that we shouldn't just be able to, to deploy models. Ideally, we want to provide models and pre-trained models to really encourage the reuse and, and sharing of machine learning models for image analysis. So this is, I would say, a, a grassroots <laughs> effort and it's a collaborative project. So please reach out if you're interested in taking part of this and contributing to this. It's not going to be launched this year, I should say. It will be sometime early next year. So with that, I'd like to summarize my talk and with a little outlook and say that we're working a lot with highly multiplexed imaging to understand co-expression of variable proteins and crosstalk between oscillatory cellular processes. We're very interested in identifying drivers of non-genetic proteum heterogeneity so that we can make sure to visualize those drivers in the multiplexed assays. We're working with generative modeling to build a whole proteome subcellular map and aim to include both genetic variants and, and drug screening uh, phenotypes and such as well down the line. We, of course, believe in open science. And uh, then again, I'd like to remind you about the Kaggle challenge in January. And with that, I would like to thank my lab. It's great to be back with them in Sweden, even though we're all working from home right now. And also thank my collaborators and funders. And thank you all for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Emma, for this great seminar. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute or type on the chat box, please. And in the meantime, maybe I can ask one question. So you talked about uh, really beautiful images of cell cycle, but how about the cell division, right? After that, the cells are asymmetrically or symmetrically might be dividing and which daughter cell gets which proteins, like there's some variability. Is there any interesting uh, proteins that you observed in there or? Yes, there are some, the, the majority of proteins are symmetrically distributed, at least in the cells that we are working with, but there are some proteins where we see asymmetry and it seems to particularly be with when you have this cytosolic nuclear distribution, mm -hmm. we sometimes see that the nuclear, all the nuclear proteins go to one daughter cell, whereas the other cell only keeps the cytosolic portion of it. So it, it, it would be very interesting to look into how that connects to, for example, ep epigenetic uh, uh, marks for example. Yeah, that's very exciting. I can research direction. <laughs> uh, yeah, very, very fascinating talk. Thanks, Emma. And I have a uh, lot of questions, but I'll try to keep just uh, two. Uh, so I think one is really, uh, just a quick comment about uh, the question I may ask. Uh, I think in uh, stem cell differentiation, that's uh, it's a well known, right? So there's asymmetric cell differentiation. Uh, and uh, the factor that determines whether or not the cells kind of go symmetric versus asymmetric is the surrounding cells. So uh, I think you kind of mentioned that a little bit, right? So beyond the single cells and uh, kind, of, kind of population of cells, so often the protein expression is not just the one particular cell, actually largely um, so dependent on how their neighbors are doing. <laughs> so uh, I know it seems like you are thinking along this line. So just uh, want to hear more uh, yeah, your yeah. opinion. Yeah, I, I think that is totally correct. And we often see this. Well, well, what I didn't show is that when we look at these proteins that are non-cell cycle dependent, we see different types of spatial patterns emerging. Sometimes mm -hmm. we see what we call well-mixed populations. So very close to what you would get if you have a random pattern. Sometimes we see small clusters emerging and sometimes we see very large clusters of expressing cells emerging. So we are currently trying to, to together with a former postdoc of mine, Oana uh, Karja, simulate this so that we're simulating the, the, 
what would this population of cells look like given one intrinsic signal and one extrinsic signal and then we're changing the distance of the extrinsic signal to see if we can match these patterns and it seems like we pretty well can do that and then we're also changing the positioning of the cells in relation to each other and, and things like that so it's definitely depending on that and what we're also doing or, or starting to do in parallel to it is to hold one cell out and see if we can express predict the spatiotemporal distribution of proteins in that cell given only the surrounding cells for example uh, so we're, we're trying to get a better handle on it but uh, it, it, it's a lot of unknowns so far but it's fun yeah it's fascinating it's a, I, I think it, this kind of further opened up a much much broader uh, space in this uh, sort of spatial protein uh, so I think another question um, in your uh, so I, I know you are looking at uh, primarily the cell cycle dependent proteins and uh, uh, maybe a good control experiment or control system would be if you can pick the kind of most of mitotic cells, uh, they will never divide <laughs> uh, and see what proteins they highly conserve in there and compared to the dividing cells. I, I don't know if you have thought about uh, this experiment. Yes, we've thought about it. Um, and we've also also thought about maybe using the tissue data for that and just look at non-dividing cells versus dividing cells in the human body to see wh which proteins mm -hmm. are differentially expressed there. So I, we're still leaning towards that direction, but um, I like your suggestion as well. Yeah, uh, I, I have one more question and then I will uh, give the, <laughs> uh, the chance to all the audience. And uh, the, the, I think your uh, your citizen uh, uh, ideas of the <laughs> that game, uh, the, the gamers to science is super fascinating. Uh, I would say it's super fascinating for my kids as well. <laughs> so my question is really whether or not you, uh, you think um, sort of the kids can also play in the game or there are any restriction or, may, or maybe there are better gamers. Well, <laughs> yes, I think that for playing EVE Online, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want my kids to do that. They actually okay. have an 18 year old limit for it. And uh -huh. the average age of the gamers is they're pretty old. I think it's 39 or something. So it, uh -huh. it's not the a kids crowd or maybe kids say that they're 39 so that they can play uh, okay. I don't know. but uh, I definitely think that kids could do this yes yeah or maybe create a super mario version of your, <laughs> your, exactly. your game yeah. I, I do think that the sweet spot comes if we would build games for because the, the most of the problems in in any type of image analysis is creation of the ground truth so if we could build mm. games where you could mark up images and, and generate that ground truth and allow for kind of human in the loop design so that you're iteratively doing training and retraining the machine learning models and then only provide the examples where you actually need it to be checked and corrected. I think it could be very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. We'll see if I ever get around to doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one here. It was really fascinating talk. I'm a huge fan of the um, the virtual standing applications. I and mean, you showed a couple, you showed the conditional synthesis of a, like the cell membrane images condition on the bright field and then the style GAN application. Um, I was wondering if your group has experimented at all with like leveraging maybe parts of that style GAN architecture to do conditional image synthesis since the style GAN produces those really photorealistic um, images that you showed of the U2OS cells. Um, if you could condition on like a bright field image of U2OS to produce one of those protein atlas type pictures, if, mm -hmm. if that's maybe where, where you're headed with that work. Exactly. Thank, thanks, by the way. Uh, yes, exactly. That is where we're heading. But right now we're conditioning on the two markers, Doppy and Microtubal. So we're conditioning any protein on those two, which means that we can basically take any image and then just conditioning on those markers, add other proteins to that image. Gotcha. So th th that is what we, we have. Unfortunately, we don't have bright field images for all the images in the cell atlas. If I would redo mm -hmm. the cell atlas today, I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be really, really powerful. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Any other questions? So in the meantime, I can maybe ask one question. So when you're building digital cell, you're mostly thinking about a normal phenotype, 
right? And uh, so how about the cancer cells? Can we predict them? Like aberrant C, can this yeah. be modeled? This is cancer cell lines. And I think that we are thinking that if we just work with as many oh. different cell types and cell lines as we can, we can capture Basically, we want to capture as much of the morphological phenotypic space mm -hmm. as possible. So many types of cells, ideally also many types of perturbations, maybe even mm -hmm. different types of substrates that the cells grow on, because we do want to make sure that we don't, right now we can only make HPA style images, so it will be mm -hmm. hard for anyone else. Because ideally, I, I should also say that we, we, the reason that we're so focused on these tools in the browser is, of course, that we consider our battleground to be in the browser with the Protein Atlas, and right now you can search for gene names, but that's not very much fun, right? It would be much better if you could upload an image and search for images or even upload, I wanna see this protein predicted onto this image, for example. So we're, we're also trying to, to work in, in that direction. I think, I think that would be important, important, right? If you can model disease and go back and forth between the reverse and the forward models, I think that would be pretty cool for systems medicine yeah. approach. Yeah, but my understanding, Ahmed, that uh, what uh, Emma is trying to build is really like in a human genome uh, uh, sequencing, right? So you, 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 you build a framework and then people compare uh, the, this type of colon cancer, the leukemia, and what's the difference. And then that, that, that is how you uh, can utilize this data in the future for medicine, right? Uh, but we, we need to have that human genome sequence now first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that would, of course, be the goal that we can use this model to predict that, for example, these mutations or these perturbations would cause spatial rearrangements in the cell and then experimentally verify it. Mm. Uh, but we're, we're far from that. But it, it's a nice goal to work towards. Right, which I have. Yeah. Uh, are there uh, any other? Oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. yeah, also I uh, I remember you mentioned one uh, uh, sort of terminology, functional heterogeneity. I, I, I love it so much because we, uh, we often um, kind of use the same word. Uh, so so of, of particular interest to our laboratory, so we're looking at the cytokines and growth, growth factors. <laughs> I wonder if you are able to kind of track how those proteins are produced yeah. and they're localized. So I know eventually they're going to be produced. They're going to be yeah. secreted. Uh, but before that stage, where are those proteins? Seems like I never know. <laughs> yeah, you can always send, send me the list of the gene names and we can have a look at what we, if okay. we have any data on them at least. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Exciting. Are there any other questions? If not, I think we, we don't want to keep uh, Dr. Lumberg very long, very long here. It's late night there. Uh, but thank you again, Dr. Lumberg, for this fantastic talk. And I think it's also clapping time for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And happy holidays. Happy holidays to, to yeah. you, too. And, and reach we, we check if you have any questions. Of course. Okay. Please feel bye -bye. the chat. And one final word before we close. Next, uh, of course, we don't have next week any talks because of the holidays. But on the January 8th, we're coming back, uh, also Friday, 2 p.m. And from Cornell, Dr. Oliver Elemento is presenting for COVID-infected lung tissue analysis using uh, imaging mass cytometry. And we hope to see you uh, after holidays and happy holidays for now. Bye-bye. Happy holidays. <laughs>